We're going to interrupt this series, this great series that we're in for just one weekend for a very good reason. Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Father's Day. Oh, Father's Day. Everybody celebrate Father's Day. Yes, it's Father's Day. And we're going to have a great time together. So get everybody, get all the family around this TV set, the computer, whatever you're watching, listening on, and let's enjoy and indulge in God's perspective on Father's Day. If you're a father and you're concerned thinking, oh no, I hope Pastor Stephen isn't going to give me 10 things that I'm failing at and can't do and I'm supposed to do. No, this isn't going to be a guilt trip Father's Day. This isn't going to be an unpleasant, sad day Father's Day. This is going to be a celebration. I've got good news for you, but let's get the Holy Spirit in on this case and let's have His help. He's so good at guiding us through the truth, into the truth, so that our lives are never the same and they're for the better. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. Jesus has you on assignment to help us. We need help, all the help that we can get, and we love to have your help. So right now, unfold God's precious truth in our lives that our lives will never be the same again. It doesn't matter, Father, if we're four or five years old or if we're 95 years old, you've got something new for us today, and we believe we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Look. If you're a son or a daughter, this is for you. That's all of us, right? Yes, we want to honor our fathers, it's true, but there's something mysteriously wonderful hidden in this day just for you. No matter what your background is, no matter who you are, if you are a son or a daughter, this is for you. If you're between six years old and 96 years old, I'm telling you, this is for you. Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, he once said this. He said, you can tell what was the best year of your father's life because they seem to freeze in time on the clothing style and then they just ride it out. Just ride it out. I had an uncle like that. I had an uncle who was, it seemed like every summer he'd get these black socks, pull them up to his knees and then wear these sandals, heavy leather sandals that were like from the Bible days especially if you were a Roman soldier. That's what he always wore. And I don't know when or where that was the style, but he rode that baby out. <laughs> Once you become a dad, did you know there's certain things that you're supposed to say over and over just to, to fit in with the role, right? Like dads often say, oh, they don't make them like they used to, right? Have you ever had your dad say that? Or don't spend it all in one place. That's a good dad line. Dad, you can always just throw that in anywhere and you sound very dadly. And how about this? My grandfather used to tell me, he used to say, Stephen, come here, come here, hold this. Oh my goodness. The moment I heard hold this, I knew that this was going to be a painful act of self-sacrifice. <laughs> Celebrating Father's Day is a good thing, no matter what your situation is, no matter what your past is or your experience has been. You know, some of us have grown up with great dads. For others, that wasn't their story. Me personally, I grew up without a dad, but that makes me the perfect person to lead you on this journey for a few minutes to celebrate this God invention. Yes, it's a God invention called fatherhood because God is the very first father, the ultimate father. And being a father is not easy. It's not a light, easy, uncourageous assignment. You know, if you're doing it right, I think about Jim Gaffigan, the popular comedian. He said, you know what it's like having a fourth kid? Do you know? Do you know what it's like having a fourth kid? He said, I want you to imagine drowning and then someone passes you a baby. <laughs> Ray Romano, another comedian, he said this. He said, having children, he says, is a little bit like living in a frat house. He said, nobody sleeps, everything's broken, and there's a lot of throwing up. Reed Markham, an author and an educator, he said, being a great father is like shaving. No matter how good you shave today, you have to do it again tomorrow. Very good. And William Wordsworth, he's a great poet from the 18th century, a lot more serious statement, and it's poetic, but it's beautiful. And he says this, Father, to God himself, we cannot give a holier name. Isn't that beautiful? And isn't that just the truth, the biblical truth? 
You see, God the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth, the architect and the engineer of the cosmos, every star in the universe, in the universe, the source of power for the sun, the legislator of every law discovered and still undiscovered by mankind. He, God, wanted children. And so he made you. He made me. He created us in his image. If Father's Day says anything to you and I, it should be this. You, you're pretty special. You're very significant. Your life matters, and that's a message directly from the heart of Father God. To celebrate Father's Day, we should at the very least recognize the Father of all fatherhood and what He delights in. You, you being in his family and enjoying all of his family benefits. He delights in giving you those things. You are the apple of his eye. And the heart of fatherhood is willing to make sacrifices to show that fatherly love. Well, let me just give you a quick little story just to kind of demonstrate that, that loving fatherly sacrifice here on earth, demonstrated through Men who aren't necessarily perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but given their best. This comes from a little boy. Um, his name was Will, seven years old. When Will was seven years old, he hit his head really hard while playing with his younger brother. His dad, Nate, took him to the hospital to, to get checked out and just to be on the safe side. But the CT scan found that little Will had a serious head injury. He had suffered a skull fracture and his brain was bleeding. The doctor said the boy had mere hours to live unless he got emergency surgery. Now listen to this. Scared little Will, he understood that the surgery was necessary, but he was still terrified. And believe it or not, one of the things that really concerned him was getting his head shaved. He, th he thought that was going to be tragic. But Nate, his dad, assured him that it would be okay. And just to prove it, guess what Nate did? You got it. He shaved his head too. Will is now eight years old, fully recovered, strong, and he said this about his dad. He said, seeing my dad's bald head made me laugh and feel a lot better about my head. Now he's teaching me how to skateboard and it's so much fun. And listen to this, he said, he is my hero, my hero. Stories like that make you ask, what is fatherhood really all about? Why are fathers so important? What is it about dads that can make them either the hero, the major hero, or a traumatic zero? Pam Brown, a great author and poet, she said this, Dads are most ordinary men turned by love into heroes, adventurers, storytellers, and singers of song. If you were to walk the corridors and the cell blocks of prisons anywhere and everywhere in the world, you would find an epidemic of daddy issues, fatherlessness, generational abandonment, and horrific abuse. Frederick Douglass from the 1800s, an, an amazing orator, uh, the great abolitionist. He was um, uh, an amazing communicator an African-American gentleman who helped stop slavery, not just in North America, but worldwide. And he said this, he said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. There's a mystery hidden in the word for father. And I want us to uncover it here right now. I want you to hear this. This is um, so beautiful as you just explore the word for father, check this out. The word for father in the Hebrew language is just two letters. Now these two Hebrew letters tell us, they give a word picture that says this, the father is the strength of the family, the leader or the first of the house. Now not the boss, but the leader. You know what that means? The leader in love, service, help, protection, even sacrifice. He is the original seed of the house. The father leads by example. Interestingly, when you take those two Hebrew letters that make the word father and put the Hebrew letter He in the middle, which means that that letter He is actually a picture of a window, an open window 
access window. So when you put that letter hey in the middle of those two Hebrew letters that make up the word for father, guess what you get? You, these three letters comprise the Hebrew letter word for love. So with all three letters for the word love, we see the full meaning of the word love to be the heart of the father revealed. Isn't that beautiful? Guess what? 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. The Father God is love. Oh, this is getting interesting, isn't it? You see, because fatherhood is all about identity. It's all about your identity. Fatherhood is all about receiving true identity. And if you don't get that, you can't understand the power, the true power of fatherhood. Interestingly, now that follow me on this, if you swap the middle letter that we talked about in the word for love, that letter hey, to the Hebrew letter I, meaning where, it asks the question where. Instead of a window, you get a closed fist in the middle of that word for father. You get the word for hate, not love, but hate. And it gives us the picture of unloved, powerless, unsafe, angry kids, hate. When there's no access to the Father's heart, there is hate. It's a feeling like they don't belong. You know what? There's even 50 and 60-year-old kids who are still that feeling that closed fist and have that prevailing attitude of being, being unloved, fearful, unsatisfied, and they live a hateful life. It's tragic. The art of true fatherhood is so misunderstood in our culture because we've lost the value of true identity. And I'm, when I say identity, think the word name, what a real name is. Proverbs 22, one says, says that a good name is to be chosen above silver and gold, above riches. That's how valuable a good name or an identity really is. But our culture has lost a grip on what a real identity is, even is. In Exodus 33, Moses asked the question of God. He says, God, show me your glory. I want to see the essence of who you really are. And guess what God's answer is? He says, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of this rock and make my goodness and my name. See, that's the essence of God's identity. I'm going to make my goodness and my name pass by you. And you can look on it. Look on the residue of it because Moses was still under the old covenant. He couldn't look on even the full power of it. But after when he did look on it, he was glowing for days. That's how it affected the aura of it, even his physical presence. Here's just a few things that are integral to the Father God's character and His family name. God's name. Did you know that God's name or His ID is a strong tower and provides safety? That's Proverbs 18.10. Did you know that God's name is holy? That's what Jesus told us in Matthew 6 verse 9. God's name saves us from sin and death. God's name, his identity, helps shepherd boys kill giants. Remember when David went up against the giant? He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jehovah, the God of Israel. Oh, he used the name to take down a giant. His name, God's name, means shepherd, protector, guide, provider, healer, deliverer, peace, Present, meaning that he's always with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. It means power, authority. His name is above every other name, his identity. And we have access to it through Jesus. The power in fatherhood gives you your true identity. Jesus came as the only begotten son of God so that every day can be a type of spiritual father's day for you and me owning our identity in Christ. Whew. Praise God. Fatherhood is all about the name. And therefore, it's all about your identity. We live in a world that in the natural is in free fall at a complete loss for identity. You know, the big question in this modern era is, you know, how do you identify? As if the power of choice or the power of option is somehow in and of itself freedom, but it's not. You see, true identity, if you have no true identity, then you have no true love. And therefore, you're left with just this emptiness that pulls in the hate. That's all you have, powerlessness and hate. 
In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, God sets before us life and death, blessing and cursing, and then He even helps us make the choice. He tells us, choose life, choose blessing. We all have free will and we can choose either or, but real freedom is under the category of life and blessing, not death and cursing. Real identity is different than a fraudulent identity because real identity releases a power and authority that works perfectly in harmony with your amazing true design. Yes, you were made on purpose for a purpose, my friend. You need to understand this. You need to understand that your purpose, that the purpose for your life is amazing. So it requires an even more amazing identity to empower it. Your purpose, you were made by the intelligent designer, God the Father. He made you in His image to be like Him and operate with His glory and power. If you have a crisis of identity, it's because you have an, you have, you've got this inherent desire to operate in power but have no power. You have this inherent desire for glory, but you've got no real true glory. Jesus even said, He said, you know, I don't look for glory from men. He says, I get my source of glory from the Father God. But you're not, you got to be plugged into the Father God's identity to get that. His name. Isn't it interesting that even Sigmund Freud, the Australian neurologist and famous for his atheism, he said this, he said, I cannot think of any need in children as strong as the need for a father's protection. Man, even when he's isolated from God by his own lack of faith, by his own belief in God, his refusal to believe in God, he still recognizes is that fatherhood is principle to be a true child, to have an identity in life. H. Jackson Brown inspirational author, New York Times bestseller, he said this, "Life doesn't come with an instruction book. That's why we have fathers. We need good fathers. Billy Graham doesn't need any introduction. And he said this, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Absolutely truth. So now let's hear what happened to this angry kid. Let's just watch what happens when you take an angry kid named Davidson and he meets up with this coach, Wilson. Let's watch what happens. Growing up, Davison was an immature, angry kid with no father. That is until he met Coach Wilson. Wilson was a coach of a varsity high school basketball team, but he was so much more than that. He was a mentor and he was a father figure to many of the boys. This included being tough when he needed to be tough. Now, young Davidson, he remembered one of the practices when he mouthed off and Wilson told him, leave. If you didn't like what he was saying, you need to just get out of here and leave. Well, of course, Davidson threw down his jersey, stormed out. The next day, after he calmed down, he had a little talk with Coach Wilson, and he taught him that passion and emotion were good, but he couldn't and he shouldn't let them control his life. That was a real turning point for young Davidson. Coach Wilson remained a part of Davidson's life long after he graduated from high school, encouraging and supporting him as he earned both a bachelor's and a master's degree. The coach still calls Davidson to check in on him, and he's been instrumental in everything the young man has ever accomplished. Davidson says this, Even though we may not share blood, he is a father to me. He calls me his son, and I consider it a great Great honor to be his son. Beautiful. The amazing miracles that are possible when a father's heart is turned to the children. It stops the curse. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to prove it to you. When a father's heart is turned toward the children, when a mentor's heart is turned toward the fatherless, it stops the curse. But it starts the blessing of true identity. True fatherhood doesn't pull strength from the weakness inherent to all the genetics, but it overrides the curse with God's love. Listen to Malachi chapter four, verses five and six. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, that sounds scary, but then verse six, 
and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. See, he's not just talking about biological fathers. He's talking about those with an attitude to mentor the next generation, those with a heart to cover, protect, to invest in children, fatherless children, those who need to be um, mentored, those who want to be protégés of a leader, of somebody who's going to teach them. Elijah is a biblical type and forerunner of prophets who give big warnings of what's to come and announce big arrivals, just like John the Baptist did for announcing Jesus coming. See, isn't it interesting that these are the final words of the Old Testament, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. And notice the order. It's first turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and then the hearts of the children to the fathers. It's important to know and understand this. God the Father sent Jesus to hang on the cross and redeem us from the curse. It's not God's will for any person to perish. But if God leaves the room, did you get this? If God is told to leave the room, His goodness and His name go with Him. If you understand all the goodness, the benefits, the mercy and the love that are in His God package, you don't ever want Him to leave the vicinity. No. No, no, only a very, very ignorant person unaware of God's goodness would ever want God to vacate the premises. But be assured, if you get what you want and God does back off, there's nothing, there's nothing but curse, death and misery that end up filling that void, that empty void. Life does not tolerate a vacuum, my friend. Emptiness is destruction, poverty, pain, misery, hate. It's the very essence of a closed fist, that Hebrew word, that closed fist to the Father's heart, God's heart. It is God's design for us all to have connection with His spiritual family. And that means we all need spiritual fathering to live as spiritual sons and daughters. Without that connection, do you see what happens? A curse comes on the land. Destruction comes on the land. Look at what we see around us all the time. We see all these fatherless people. They they end up rioting. They end up in a chaotic state because they need that connection, that family connection. In 1 Samuel, God ended up rebuking his prophet Eli for not restraining his sons. They ended up being cursed. They died. But then on the other hand, look at when God chose Abraham because Abraham modeled being a good father and Abraham didn't even have any children at the time. Abraham was worshiping the sun, moon and stars. And yet God chose him because he said, here's a guy that's going to raise up his children in the right way. Well, how did he know that? Abraham didn't have Isaac at that time. He didn't even have Ishmael at that time. But, you know, Abraham was influential with all of the younger people around him. He was a leader. He was a father. He believed in helping the next generation. God's looking for human hearts that will carry his heart. The father's heart loves heart. Fathers are empowered to impart identity. Without your true identity, you're unprotected. You get hit over and over and over living under the curse. Have you ever, anybody identify with that? Have you ever felt like, man, why do I just keep getting hit? Why do I feel unprotected? I just keep getting hit over and over. And then it puts you in this self-protection mode, which is not really healthy. Is it a coincidence that Jesus, in paying the price to redeem us from the curse, was struck over and over and over? Why did God... Isaiah even says that it pleased the Father God to bruise His only begotten Son. Why? Because Jesus was paying the price for us to be covered and protected from the hit after the hit after the hit. Is it a coincidence that Jesus paying the price for us at the cross was sentenced not for anything that he did, not for any of his good actions that he had done or had accomplished. He was sentenced before who he said he was for his identity, being God's son. That's why they they said he was um, guilty of blasphemy for who he said he was. Let's look at John 14, verse 6. Jesus said this, 
He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to who? The Father, except through me. See, we have to understand that Jesus is always moving us in a direction. He's the way, but the way to where? The way to whom? The way to the Father. Jesus, the Son, came to bring us to the Father. He's always moving us one direction, one way, into the family, to the Father. Father's Day, the gospel, the good news is all about restoring our relationship to the Father. Jesus is the way, but the way to where? The Father, the source of true identity, the source of true love. The gospel is all about the ultimate Father's Day. Because of Jesus, we get to be children of the Most High God and we get all the benefits of His family. In truth, we even get to be loved by Father God with the same love that He loves Jesus. Remember in John 17, 23, that's what Jesus said. He said, oh, Father, I, I want them all to understand that you love them with the same love that you love me. This is Jesus talking. Oh, praise God. What does God the Father want to give you on this day? For the Father's heart, what does He want to give you on Father's Day? Simple. He wants to give you His name. He wants to reveal to you the family name and have you discover your true identity as a child of His, as a child of God, led by the Holy Spirit, enjoying all of the benefits through Jesus. God the Father, He's not arrived at this day unprepared for you. No, no, no. Your Heavenly Father has gifts and particular works of grace that He's prepared already to give you. That's amazing grace that you get not what you deserve, but what Jesus deserves. No matter if it's Father's Day, no matter if Father's Day is joyful or painful for you full of beautiful memories or tragic nightmares. God the Father has the ability to redeem the past through Jesus Christ. There's only one Father that Jesus the Son leads us to so that we can receive our royal identity that makes even, listen to this, even the angels of heaven stand in complete awe and attention and reverence at the, the, the childhood, royal childhood status that God has put on you through Jesus. Abba, Father, God, your Father in heaven. Jesus said this, and he said it this way, with a new sense of identity in Christ, why don't we pray what Jesus taught us to pray together as the family? Say this with me. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God. What a perfect anthem of prayer for all of us, all of us to join in as sons and daughters, as children of our Heavenly Father, from being a boy who once had no reason to celebrate Father's Day to right now, every day is Father's Day for me. Every day should be Father's Day for you because God has made us children of His through His Son, Jesus, the perfect Son. You know what? There's a button on our website that simply says, Jesus. You can share and get more prayer connection there for specific requests. Also, I want you to join us for our Tuesday talks. It's on what day? But Tuesday, where you can chat with us, ask questions, have fun. And basically, we're just going to have a time of prayer, coffee, and conversation right there in your home, in your living room. Aren't you excited about God flooding your home with His presence? He wants to set up life in your life right now.